Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask Concussion Doc, episode 17. Got my boy Rick with me here. Uh, as always, you can watch us live on Instagram, Facebook, uh, live. And if you miss it, you can catch us on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, or our YouTube channel if you want to see the video. So three questions today. The first one is talking about the um, symptoms and symptom onset, uh, delayed symptom onset, that type of thing. Uh, question number two is looking at connecting with athletes both on and off the field and some of the challenges around communication. And number three, um, somebody concerned about CTE. I think there's a lot of us that are concerned, so I'm going to discuss a little bit about that as well as some of the research that came up um, just last week from the University of Buffalo, really big, well, not a really big study, but uh, in terms of numbers, it was a, it was a, it was a small study. Uh, however, there was a lot that was involved in it. It was looking at CTE, so I'm going to use that to kind of uh, bring the point around about CTE. I also featured this study in one of my recent Facebook posts, and uh, we had a lot of questions and a lot of people uh, expressing concern about some of the uh, issues around CTE and so I think this is a good way to uh, maybe explain it and bring it you know um, back to everybody. Okay so getting into it question number one is sometimes after impact symptoms take time to manifest even a whole 24 hours later do we understand why? Uh, the, the answer really is we don't really understand why. Uh, the thought process is, is that most of the time concussion is going to occur and as soon as that impact happens, you're going to get an immediate onset of symptoms either, well immediate or shortly thereafter within you know, minutes to, to hours later. Um, sometimes it can be the next day or maybe two or three days later where the symptoms actually come on. And um, some of the thought around why that might happen. And we have to look at what the pathophysiology of a concussion is. The initial impact itself creates this electrical storm that happens inside the brain. That electrical storm itself, all that neuronal discharge, all that firing that's happening inside the brain, the excitation phase of the concussion can cause symptoms to be immediately apparent. Sometimes, let's say that injury happens in an area that isn't perceivable by you. For example, it's not, it doesn't affect your visual system right away. You don't have ringing in the ears. You may not have you know, confusion right away. You might not have a display of any of the you know, signs and symptoms right immediately, but they manifest hours later. Well, there's a second phase to concussion. So the first phase is that excitation phase. That's a short duration thing. Uh, anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes long and then it kind of calms down. The second phase of the concussion is what's called spreading depression and that's where your energy stores start to drop. So all that firing that happens in that excitatory phase now burns a lot of energy which continues to drop hours to days later. And that drop in energy may be the cause of those symptoms that tend to come on two, three, four days later. Things just keep getting kind of worse and worse and worse. And so what you know may have been something that seemed inconsequential during the game where you just you got hit, you felt fine, you kept going, and then six hours later you start getting the headache. Uh, you know, you wake up in the morning, you start feeling worse. That's likely because of that energy level that just continues to drop over time for the first few days. Uh, then it hits its peak low around day four to day six, somewhere in that kind of middle range. And then you start regaining energy all the way back up until you're back up to kind of that full restored, fully recovered um, area. So that's one theory as why there's the potential for delayed symptom onset. Another theory um, that I guess is is a little well less established. Um, this is something that I've thought about quite a bit is if you think about um, what's also happening when you get a concussion is you're also going to get some sort of whiplash mechanism. You're also going to potentially damage some of the soft tissues and joints in the neck and the symptoms of whiplash and neck injury are the exact same as they are for concussion. But the symptoms of tissue injury sometimes take a few days to manifest. So a perfect example of this for those of you that have played sports, if you've ever sprained your ankle, well, you sprain your ankle, it hurts right away, but a lot of times you can continue to play on it. You know, it's, it, it hurts, but you're able to kind of push through it. But then you go to sleep. Well, when you sleep, 
and you're not, you don't have movement, inflammation sets into the area and just start, everything swells. You wake up in the morning, your ankle's this big, and now you can't even put weight on it at all. And that, I think, is a similar thing that's what's happening in concussion injuries is that you get hit, uh, you may not feel symptoms right away because maybe you didn't even get a concussion, but maybe you got some sort of whiplash injury that happened at the same time. Well, the symptoms of that may not present right away, but then next day and the day after that, as the inflammation sets in and the tissue injury starts to kind of you know make itself known, well, now you start feeling dizzy. Now you start getting the headaches. Now you start feeling a little bit foggy. And so there could be that. So there's a direct overlap with the symptoms of whiplash and concussion, which makes it kind of difficult to discern. And so... It could be due to the dropping energy over time. It could be due to the symptoms of neck or tissue injury that are slowly creeping up as the days go on. So I think that's probably uh, as best we understand it at this point. Um, no one, I don't think, really has a good understanding as to why some people have immediate versus delayed symptoms. But um, those are kind of the two ideas, uh, at least that I've heard around, around that. Uh, moving on to question number two. What are some of the challenges your organization faces when it comes to connecting with athletes on and off the field? Uh, well, I mean, this has been a challenge not only for our organization, but I think for every sport in general and every healthcare practice in general is how to communicate, you know, how do we communicate with, you know, injured athletes as they're going through the recovery? Also, how do we provide communication to the coaching staff who's dealing with these athletes on a day to day basis? How do we communicate uh, return to play status? How do we tell a coach that, you know, at practice today, I want, I want you to run these specific drills to try and get a you know, feel for how this athlete is performing in a certain way, whether or not they're ready to start returning back to sport or not. So, you know, communication lines, I think, are huge when it comes to sports injuries in general. And in concussion, I think it's even more so. I think that we need strong communication lines to both report that injury when it happens to the right person, but then we need communication that that injury has been confirmed, right? Especially when concussion, when you need, you know, return to play clearance letters and things like that. Well, has, has this person actually seen a healthcare professional? Has this person actually, um, um, you know, been diagnosed? Are they going through the protocols? And then in which case, which stage of the protocol are they on? That type of thing. So if you're in the NFL and you have a team doctor, well, all that's being communicated. But at the amateur levels, you don't have that. And so one of the things that we've developed within our organization, Complete Concussion Management, is the Concussion Tracker app. So the Concussion Tracker app works directly with our concussion database. And actually, Complete Concussion Management operates one of the largest concussion databases in the world where all of the clinics that are within our network utilize this for all their concussion information. So all their baseline test data is stored on this system. All the injury data, injury reports, all the stuff is stored on this system. That communicates with the smartphone app. So the smartphone app is meant for coaches and also sideline therapists so that when an injury happens, you don't have to have a binder or bag full of scat reports. You have it right on your phone. You click that athlete's name, you click report injury, and it walks you through an assessment for that athlete. And then you hit submit that report. And that report then gets sent directly to one of our certified clinics, so whatever clinic that athlete belongs to. Now that communication line is immediate, so now your injury is getting reported directly to a healthcare professional with training and concussion. Now that communication line is set up. When that athlete comes into the clinic and goes through the assessment and actually receives a formal diagnosis or formal clearance, the app updates. So now a coach who's reported an injury on a kid knows as soon as that assessment happens that, okay, the diagnosis has been confirmed. And then as they go through the process of returning back to school, returning back to sport, teachers have access to that app as well. So they can see what stage an athlete's on, what they're allowed to do in school, what they're not allowed to do in school. And then the same thing goes for the coaching staff of their particular team. So that way, any as the process happens, every single person is now kept within the communication circle. 
Everyone has a job to do when it comes to concussion. There's so many people that are stakeholders for a particular individual, teachers, coaches, training staff, medical professionals, etc. And this system was designed to keep everybody on the same page, to keep kind of a cohesive unit, to keep everyone working together, to make sure that the right things are done at the right time and make sure that nothing slips through the cracks. Uh, this app actually also reports the injury to other sports. So if this you have a multi-sport athlete, which is extremely common this day and age, where somebody is a lacrosse player, but they also play on the football team and maybe the hockey team, as soon as that injury gets reported on the lacrosse team, the football coach and the hockey coach and everyone else automatically receive a notification saying that there's been a suspected concussion. So when Johnny tries to skirt the system and get back onto the soccer field because the soccer coach doesn't know that he got a concussion playing football, well, now the, now the soccer coach does know because that has immediately been notified to, to everybody else. So that's how we're dealing with some of the challenges around communication and concussion. Uh, I'd love to hear some other ideas around this because it's obviously a huge component of sports injury management and in particular concussion. So that's that. Uh, third question, um, obviously a bit of a sensitive topic when you start talking about CTE and the long-term effects of concussions on the brain. Um, this question comes uh, from AJ Glover, um, someone who has a pretty extensive concussion history, diagnosed, not diagnosed. What can I try to do to prevent diseases such as CTE? Now, we don't really know a lot about CTE. The media has us believing that there's a lot of information on CTE. It has us believing that CTE is a, um, a fact. If you have concussions, you're likely to get CTE, and that's actually not necessarily true. What CTE is, it's chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and as far as we know, it's a neuropathological condition that can only be diagnosed post-mortem. So after someone dies, we can take a look at their brain, and what we're looking for is something called tau protein. Hyperphosphorylated tau protein is found in a number of different conditions. The, the classification of this type of disease is called a tauopathy. And I think there's about 20 different types of tauopathies. Alzheimer's is a type of tauopathy. So tau can accumulate in the brain for a number of reasons. We don't really know why necessarily for all of those reasons. One of the theories, theories, and I'm going to say that, one of the theories is that head trauma or repetitive concussions may be a reason that tau starts to accumulate in the brain. But there's also a number of different reasons why tau can accumulate in the brain. For example, opiate medications are known to cause increased tau deposition. How many NFL players and former athletes are taking opiate medications on a regular basis? There was a study that was done that found that more than 70% of NFL players, former NFL players, considered themselves abusers of opiate medication during and after their playing careers. So how much does that weigh into the cause or why there's tau protein inside the brain, right? So all we have right now is a group of people in what's called a case series, which is actually the lowest form of scientific evidence that we have because there's no controls, right? We're not looking at healthy people. How many, how many um, you know, former non-contact athletes might have CTE in their brain because maybe it's not due to contact at all. Maybe it's due to something else. Maybe it's a genetic variant that, that normal people have. Maybe up until this point, it's been considered to be Alzheimer's disease. And so every time we found it, we said, yeah, there it is, it's Alzheimer's. But maybe it's the same patterning as we see in CTE. We haven't done enough research yet on the general population to know that the only defining thing is head you know, injury. So when you're talking about the concerns around CTE and things you can do to prevent CTE, we don't even know if it's caused by head trauma. We have no causal link between head trauma and the pathophys or the pathological findings of what is CTE. So we don't even have that link. Secondly, we don't even have the link that the tau protein that we're seeing inside the brain actually results in any type of neurocognitive impairment in life. For example, studies done on Alzheimer's disease find that about 50% of the time, so literally half the time, that they think people have Alzheimer's in life, when they actually open up their brains after they die and look for signs of tau, they don't have any at all. 
Then you have the reverse happen where you have 50% of the time if you look at a brain that didn't have signs and symptoms of dementia or cognitive impairment in life, 50% of the time you open up that brain and it has tau protein inside of it. So how can we then assume that tau protein is the cause of the symptoms that people experience? The symptoms that people are experiencing with CTE are very nonspecific, right? Things like depression, rage, anger, um, suicidal ideation, okay? These are all things that are also present in things like depression and anxiety disorders, okay? Mental health is a very complex thing, okay? You can start to have mild cognitive impairment and, and things like that because, you're, because of anxiety, Right? There's a lot of things that lead to this, this feeling that you can't focus and that could be completely related to mental health. One of the most depressing times in someone's life is retirement at any age. So if you take somebody who's in their 60s and they're 65 and they're about to retire, that's a big life change. That tends to result in an increased rate of depression. Now if we take that and we dial that back and we, we put that now into a professional athlete and now that retirement is happening at age 28 and they've retired due to potentially due to injuries or whatever else. How much is that going to cause depression and how much of that depression is then going to lead to the, the rage, the anger, the inability to concentrate, the, the suicidal ideation and all that stuff. But everyone looks at it and says this is due to concussions or this is due to head trauma and we actually don't have that link established at all. This is very early stage research, but it sells papers. It sells headlines. It sells ad revenue because people click on it because people are interested in it. When you actually read the research on it, it's really not that cut and dry. Example, large study, again, not large in number, but large in volume in terms of what they did with these athletes. University of Buffalo, uh, they did a study, there was 21 former NFL and former NHL athletes. Mostly NHL, not so much of the NFL, but mostly NHL athletes. And they were compared to 21 non-contact athletes of the same age, sex, ethnicity, etc. They measured them. This actually got lumped into three separate studies because there was so much involved in what they did. The first study was looking at mild cognitive impairment. The second study was looking at executive function and mental health. The third study was looking at advanced brain imaging findings for a whole bunch of functional findings within the brain. So this is looking at people in life. The most we have right now is somebody who's died, we have their brain, and then we ask their family, well, how were they in life? Oh yeah, they were starting to lose it at the end. But we know that next of kin reports are really not that good. And so they had these players come in, and I'll just go through kind of how they did this. So they contact the alumni associations, 27 former athletes uh, volunteered for the study, 22 were included, however only 20 completed all examinations. Uh, they then had a control group of non-contact athletes. Their research team was divided into six groups to try and figure this, how to do this study. One was the assessment of lifestyle, nutrition, smoking, drug and alcohol history, and physical activity. Two was physical health, looking at physical examinations, sleep and pain. Three was psychological assessments, depression, anxiety, mental health, executive function, aggressiveness. Four was cognition, looking at memory, attention, visual, spatial orientation, intelligence, verbal skills, etc. Five was imaging, neural structures, hemodynamic, neurometabolite concentrations, etc. Number six was the research methods of how best to make this study work. So I had these people come in, they did all this stuff, they did all these questionnaires, they did all these cognitive assessments on these players. And what they found was the average playing career of the players was eight and a half years. The minimum requirement was they had to play at least two seasons of professional sports at the highest level, NFL or NHL. Contact athletes tended to have a higher body mass index versus non-contact controls. Higher education was also found in the non-contact athletes. Uh, there was no significant difference in the groups on smoking history, alcohol, or drug abuse, although the frequencies were somewhat higher in the contact athletes for a history of smoking, alcohol, or drug abuse. There was also a trend towards more frequent smoking in the contact, the former contact athletes. On physical examination, and I think this is an important finding, 
18 out of 22 of the contact athletes reported sleep problems, whereas only one out of the 21 non-contact athletes reported sleep problems. 16 out of the 22 contact athletes had had surgery due to injuries they sustained while playing, whereas zero of the non-contact athletes had. Let's bring it back now to opioid medications, okay? Surgical, chronic pain, all of that stuff can affect your ability to concentrate, it can affect your memory because you're so focused on pain and other things. 19 out of the 22 contact athletes reported chronic pain that was confirmed on physical examination versus only one of the 21 non-contact athletes. Non-contact athletes were also twice as likely to participate in regular exercise and expended significantly more kilocalories per week versus, non -con versus contact athletes. Here's a quote. All differences found between the groups would tend to bias towards lower cognitive functioning in the group of contact athletes. Things like having a higher rate of obesity can affect your cognitive function, and that was higher in the former contact athletes versus the non-exercise or lack thereof can affect your cognitive uh, capacity, and yet most of the non-contacts were not exercising regularly as opposed to the two, or sorry, most of the contacts were not uh, exercising as opposed to the non-contacts who were. Um, and so here's the findings. Executive function. Contact athletes perceived themselves to have issues with working memory and overall rated themselves more poorly on executive function compared with non-contact controls. However, quote, Objective findings of factors associated with executive function revealed no differences between the groups even for working memory. Then the study on cognitive function. Contact at the, the contact athletes had less education and lower IQ. Despite a broader range of neurocognitive tests, there were only a few tests that showed that contact athletes were less capable. The contact athletes were more likely to qualify as mild cognitive impairment. However, these different differences were not significant. The differences appearing to be primarily related to education levels, IQ, and body mass index. On to the imaging study. We did not find any neurometabolic, hemodynamic, functional, or structural differences on MRI between the contact and non-contact athletes. Interestingly, the only difference between the groups was the presence of cerebral microbleeds where, where more non-contact athletes had microbleeds in the brain versus the contact athletes, which is obviously surprising. Quote here, the athletes who are experiencing mild cognitive impairment may have more to worry about because of obesity, chronic pain, and sleep disturbances than they do with a history of playing contact sports. So when you were to control for that, it almost eliminated the differences. And so when we look at this and we have somebody who's had a history of concussions, who's now asking us the question, what can I do to prevent it? I think the biggest thing you can do to help yourself is to realize that this is not a foregone conclusion. There's a lot of evidence showing that CTE doesn't necessarily occur or that the findings we're finding in the brain don't necessarily you know, mean that this is a disorder that's related to concussions. And I think the more we start thinking about it as former athletes that have had a history of concussions, the more we're gonna start to feel like there's something wrong with us. And if you start looking for things like if you start thinking oh my god I'm, I'm starting to get forgetful you'll start to notice it more and more and more and more and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and then you become anxious about it and worried about it and then you feel like it's getting worse and worse and worse and this could be completely attributed to mental health anxiety um, psychological well-being all of these things and so I would say that if you feel like you're going this way make sure you talk to somebody who's a professional that can help you out with this uh, it may be a psychologist it may be somebody who's an expert in in neurodegenerative conditions and things like that but I think the best thing we can do is realize that the evidence is not as strong as what you're being led to believe and if you consider that fact I think that will help you out from a psychological perspective and potentially um, um, let you get your life back. That's it. It was a little bit involved today. We went into a lot of stuff, but uh, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next week. As always, if you missed it or if you want to pass it on to somebody else, check us out on SoundCloud or on Apple Podcasts or check us out on YouTube. See you guys later.